Radioisotope dating is considered to be a reliable method in support of the millions and billions of years required by evolution. Is there any scientific data against radioisotope dating? There is, and you're going to see it today on Creation Magazine Live. Creation Magazine Live. Today we're going to tackle uh, radioisotope dating methods. That's right. Creation Magazine frequently has uh, articles dealing with radioisotope dating and, uh, and some of the flaws involved in that method. That's what we're going to be doing today on Creation Magazine Live. Right. Now, other than Creation Magazine, there are some resources that are quite technical, of course, that um, get into these dating methods that uh, can help Christians in this area. But uh, we're just going to go over the, the surface of some of the stuff here try to, today. Try to keep it more simple. Yeah. Most people have heard of of radioisotope dating methods. Now, radioisotope dating, that's the generic term that applies. That even includes carbon dating. A lot right. of people have heard of carbon dating, that kind of thing. And it, theme, it seems authoritative when, when a, and a result is given. You know, this, this rock was dated to one and a half billion years old, plus or minus 100,000. Right. You think, well, okay, if it's not exactly one and a half billion, maybe it's, maybe it's plus or minus 100,000. Right, they're admitting there may be a slight error, but it still sounds yeah. authoritative that that this gives like a very definite... The rock definite isn't 6,000 years old. <laughs> right. Right? It, it's, it has that, that air of authority to it. Right. Well, I think one of the challenges is most people don't really understand how these methods work. Uh, like, really, they, they just are taking it on an authority figure, telling them this, it's scientific, and they, they don't really understand how it works. Right. They don't understand that there are uh, many assumptions in these, these methods that aren't really uh, that scientific, if you will, in terms of what we, we actually know this or this or this. There's, there's many assumptions, and we're going to talk about that, right? That's right. That's what we want to do. We want to clarify that on the program today. <coughs> now, radioisotope dating is often, it, it, is, it dates the rocks that are associated with fossils. Now, sedimentary rocks that contain fossils can't be dated directly, but right. the rocks associated with that right. are then dated. And the, the igneous rocks, the ones that were m once molten, right? So um, this relates to our topic because if fossils are dead things and death occurred before man's sin, then this contradicts what the Bible clearly states. That's why this is important. Right. Normally, when an animal dies, it decays quickly. The skin decays and the bones fall apart or disarticulate. Finding fossilized soft tissue such as skin implies very rapid burial before it decayed. Describing a duck-billed dinosaur unearthed in South Dakota, one researcher said, you can see the individual scales. Because of the presence of skin and the complete articulation of the animal, it was obviously not killed and it was obviously not scavenged. A worldwide flood would rapidly bury animals and rapidly buried animals, not buried slowly, are exactly what we see in the fossil record. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. www.creationontheweb.org has grown to become the world's most powerful internet resource on the creation evolution issue. There are more than 5,000 articles already online and new articles are added daily. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and the evidence for a global flood, the age of the earth from both the Bible and science, scientific arguments against the Big Bang and models that explain observations in astronomy within a young earth time frame, recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, and many, many more topics. These thousands of articles are available for free 24 hours a day to anyone on earth with an internet connection. One of the main reasons that CMI built this website is to strengthen the faith of Christians. Genesis is one of the most attacked areas of the Bible. Creationontheweb.org provides logical, scientifically accurate counterattacks in this area. As 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Got questions? 
Get answers at creationontheweb.org. For years, one popular evidence for a recent creation was to argue that the amount of dust on the moon must have accumulated in less than 10,000 years. The claim was based on early estimates of the rate at which dust from space accumulates on the moon's surface. If the moon really is billions of years old, there was concern that the Apollo moon landers would sink into a deep layer of dust. However, these early estimates were wrong, and by the time of the Apollo landings, NASA was not worried about sinking spacecraft. The new data makes this argument for a young moon invalid. For details, visit the Arguments Creationists Shouldn't Use section at creationontheweb.org. Okay, so we're talking about re radioisotope dating, dating methods that seem to give dates that conflict with what the Bible says about the age of the Earth, right? And uh, particularly the fact that if uh, if those fossil layers uh, with dead things in them, the the dead creatures in there, if they predate Adam and Eve, now you've got death before sin. Uh, it really contradicts uh, some uh, some major theological challenges for, yeah. for the Bible. If, if the earth is millions and billions of years old, as many scientists are saying, this clearly contradicts what Scripture plainly says. Yeah, death and everything else that we see in the fossil record, which is not very good. We see some very bad things in the fossil record that right. couldn't have existed. You know, at, the, at that point in history where God called this creation very good, which right. was about 6,000 years ago. So right. that's how the issue relates to our faith. You exactly. Know, it's, it's, if this radiometric dating is accurate, then it's, it's really an attack on the gospel. Right. It's not just some scientific issue. So exactly. how does radiometric dating work? Let's, let, let's, uh, let's deal with that first of all. Right. Well, scientists don't measure the age of something. You don't have a rock and you measure its age with some machine. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we have telescopes and we have microscopes. We don't have pastoscopes, right? We don't, we don't, that's not how it works. We don't measure the past. What they're measuring is certain isotopes of radioactive material. Uh, a rock, when a rock is cooled, and, and, and uh, only igneous rocks can be dated this way, right? Not sedimentary rocks, rocks that were once molten. The rock is cooled and, and incorporates some radioactive material. And over time, that radioactive material decays into something uh, um, non-radioactive, right? right? Into something stable. Uh, a certain isotope of uranium will decay into lead, rubidium into strontium, potassium into argon. Those are some of the isotopes that, that, uh, that can be used to age date rocks. Now, the, the method is fine. The theory is fine. You measure the amounts of, of the radioactive parent product and the stable daughter product and you infer, you calculate an age. Nothing wrong with that. That should work. But there are some assumptions that go into that method that make it inaccurate. Right, because what we're doing is studying the rates of decay that we observe today. And right. then we measure the amount of a, an isotope in, in, in some a sample. That's one of the assumptions. And we come up with an extrapolation. Right. And to, to explain the assumptions, if you think about an hourglass, here we've got an hourglass, and um, you can measure time with an hourglass. And the assumptions involved in measuring time with an hourglass relate very closely to measuring time using radiometric dating. Uh, to measure time with an hourglass, this is a half hour hourglass. It's, it, uh, it goes completely from the top to the bottom. The sand goes completely from the top to the bottom in half an hour. So if there's half on the top and half on the bottom, we could say that 15 minutes had elapsed, right? It's pretty, right. pretty basic. But we'd have to make some assumptions in order for that measurement to be accurate. We'd have to assume, number one, that all of the sand started in the upper chamber. We'd have to assume, number two, that the rate of falling sand has been constant over time. Number three, we'd have to assume that before we came in here, no one added or removed sand from the upper or lower chambers. The same assumptions apply with radiometric dating. You have something radioactive that decays over time into something stable. You have to assume, number one, just like the hourglass, that all the material that you're measuring began as radioactive material. It began in the upper chamber. What if it didn't? That's, right. that's an assumption that has to be made. And what yeah. you're talking about is if I walk into a room, I've never been in the room before, I've never seen the hourglass before, I didn't see it start, and I just see it halfway between. How can you know? I have to make right. assumptions. The second assumption, just like the hourglass, is that the nuclear decay rates from the radioactive parent to the stable daughter product have been constant over time. We weren't there millions of years. We don't know. 
Right. There's data nowadays, and we'll get into this in a few minutes, that suggests that decay rates have been dramatically accelerated in the, in the recent past. Right. The third assumption is that during the history of the life of the rock, none of the parent product or daughter product has been added or removed. In the case of the, uh, the uranium lead method, both of those elements are water soluble. Right. Well, if that rock was anywhere near water or the oceans or a river or rain or... It could or, change things who's drastically. Who's to say that? Yeah, more leached in or leached out. Right. That type of thing. I, I actually use a, a similar example when I'm uh, asked this question and, and describe, to, describe the assumptions behind it. I use the example of a, of a lit candle. If we wanted to see the decay rate of a candle and I had a 12-inch candle and I lit it, and I observed that each hour that passed, I lost, let's say, an inch off the candle. I walk into a room, there's a candle lit. It's six inches tall. Well, you could assume that six hours it elapsed, that's how long that candle had been burning. But again, you'd be assuming a 12-inch tall candle, maybe it was taller in the, in the beginning. Right. You'd be assuming uh, you know, that it wasn't lit, snuffed out, and lit again. You'd be making a, a lot, lot of, of assumptions. assumptions. All dating methods involve assumptions, including radiometric dating. Have you ever heard that your appendix is a useless vestigial organ left over from your evolutionary past? At one time, evolutionists believed there were more than 180 functionless structures in the human body, today virtually none. Even up to 2002, some dictionaries define vestigial as relating to a body part that has become small and lost its use because of evolutionary change. Today, the appendix is recognized as a special part of our immune system. For details on this or any other topic on Creation Magazine Live, visit creationontheweb.org. Okay, so we're talking about radioisotope dating. We've established that um, this is a challenge for the Bible if this, these dating methods are correct. Right. We've established that um, there are many assumptions in, if, you, if you're taking these, these dates that they're, they're throwing out here, we have to remember that there are assumptions. It's not just a slam bang. You're not just right. dating time. And uh, I guess there would be less challenge with it if there weren't so many inconsistencies that we actually find. Right, there are many. And we've recorded many of those in Creation Magazine. Right. As a matter of fact, I guess that's what we should go through now is just to show people there are many inconsistencies with these dating methods. So here, right. here's an example uh, from Creation Magazine. Uh, the title of the article was Dating Dilemma, Fossil Wood in Ancient Sandstone. So um, this is by Andrew Snelling. Uh, I'll just read you some excerpts here. It says, every major world-recognized city has its unique landmarks and features. Sydney, Australia's oldest city, settled in uh, 1788 and largest, is no exception. It has its beautiful harbor and famous bridge, its opera house and golden beaches, but it also has some unique characteristic rock formations. Uh, the Hawkesbury Sandstone. So the Hawkesbury Sandstone, named after the uh, Hawkesbury River, just north of Sydney, dominates the landscape within a 100-kilometer, 60-mile radius of downtown Sydney. The Hawkesbury Sandstone has been assigned a Middle Triassic age of around 225 to 230 million years, like you were saying, a little bit of variation, but it sounds very authoritative, right. uh, by most geologists. This is based on fossil content and on its relative position in the sequence of rock layers in the region, the Sydney Basin. Because of the hardness and durability, the Hawkesbury Sandstone not only provides a solid foundation for downtown Sydney skyscrapers, but an excellent building material. A number of Sydney's old buildings have walls and sandstone blocks. Okay, so here's where the dilemma comes in. In June 1997, a large finger-sized piece of fossil wood was discovered in the Hawkesbury Sandstone slab just cut from the quarry face. Now here's the problem. The sandstone is supposedly 225 million years old. That's what they're saying. Right. But the, the wood, the piece of wood inside of it, dated with C14, carbon dating, came out to an age of 34,000 years old. So 34,000 year old wood inside, two, two, the, what was it, 225 million year old rock? Right. So, and this isn't an intrusion. This is completely encased, as yeah. in that wood was trapped as that as the sandstone so was, was laid down. Was laid down. So th that's a huge challenge. One of these dating methods must be incorrect. All right? right. You know at least yes. that. We've got another one here. This is, again, from Creation Magazine uh, from December 99. Uh, this has to do with a radioactive dating failure in New Zealand. Standing roughly in the center of New Zealand's North Island, Mount, how would you pronounce that? Nagaruho. Nagaruho. We apologize to all uh, New Zealanders. I'm butchering this, uh, <laughs> this name here is New Zealand's newest volcano and one of its most active. 
The first lava eruption was seen by Europeans in 1870. Uh, there were ash eruptions every few years, and the major explosive eruption in April, May 1948, followed by lava flowing down the northwestern slopes in February 1949. And there was more eruptions in the uh, 1954 and 55. What's interesting, and this is many more details in, in the article in Creation, actually you can look this up on the web as well, 11 samples were collected for the purpose of radiometric dating these lava flows. Now these lava flows, as I just mentioned, were recent, Re you know, 19, 1954, 55 was right. the most recent ones. The dates that came back from the radiometric dating labs range from 270,000 years, 270,000 years, to three and a half million years. <laughs> okay. these, these rocks erupted out of this volcano. And by the way, you see this picture here of, of the volcano? That was where they filmed the Mount Doom scenes in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings movies, right. but, uh, just to bring that connection. But it has an interesting connection to the creation evolution issue. A major radioisotope radio dating failure right there at this mountain. So the, the problem is, is we've seen these rocks form. This has been in recorded history. Yes. People have observed these rocks come into being. And there's no way that age is trapped inside there. Like, evolutionists would uh, agree that this should come out to very, very young dates. Yes, the clock begins when the lava cools and solidifies and encapsulates that radioactive material. Right, so this isn't a case where, oh, well, this, you know, well, there's age in there, something like that. They think it should come out to be very young. Yes, so, so why, what's the problem? Well, it's the assumptions. Right. Right? The well, well, maybe when the lava came up out of the volcano, it already had some of that daughter product in it. Or maybe the decay rates weren't as constant. Right. Or maybe during the history of the life of the rock, sitting on the side of, of Mount Doom there, right. uh, uh, <laughs> maybe uh, uh, some, some of the elements leaked in and leaked out. Right. All of those assumptions are going to come into play with the accuracy of radiometric dating. When Dr. Carl Whelan started Creation Magazine in his home in 1978, little did he realize that today it would reach into some 140 countries all around the world and have such a huge impact in so many lives. This unique 56-page, full-color family magazine refutes evolution and gives God the glory for the amazing creation we see all around us. It gives you the answers to defend your faith and uphold the true history of the world found in Genesis. Creation Magazine is an essential tool for anyone wanting to immunize their family against the anti-biblical worldviews bombarding us from all sides. With no paid advertising, every page in Creation Magazine is full of powerful articles, ammunition to intelligently discuss nature, history, science, the Bible, and related subjects. Although written for laypeople, every effort is made to ensure that the content is technically accurate so that even experts are satisfied and young children look forward to the section written especially for them. The exciting articles also provide great witnessing material that you won't find anywhere else. Many have come to faith in Christ because of subscribers sharing this magazine with them. So subscribing not only boosts your faith, it enables you to get biblical truth into your community in a special way. Subscribe today and have it delivered to your home every three months. Visit www.creationontheweb.com for subscription information or call the CMI office nearest you. Now there's been some exciting research done very recently by a group of scientists who came together. Uh, they call themselves the RATE group. Uh, RATE, R-A-T-E, stands for Radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth. And this was a task force put together specifically to study uh, radioisotope dating. And, and they didn't just want to go in and, and, and criticize the method and point out the assumptions, which we've been doing for years, and, and they're right. legitimate, but they wanted to take things a step further and actually try and get scientific uh, information, try, scientific uh, answers against radiometric dating to show why is it giving the billions of years. Right. So it, it's not disingenuous of Christians and, and creations to say, to point out these flaws because obviously there's two models so if you point out the flaws in the other person's model that is support for for the creationist model of a young earth right. however they were looking for uh, scientific answers for why because evolutionists say well yeah but how come they always come out to be much older 
yeah, you know, billions of years versus six thousand. I mean, that's a huge difference. Right. You know? So, so these these folks are actually looking at positive proof rather than just concern. blowing holes in the other guys. Theory. Yes. <laughs> so one of the uh, one of the things they did they, there's a, n a number of different research projects all under this rate umbrella. One of the things they did is they took samples, for example, from Grand Canyon. Here you see a picture of the canyon, and there's uh, this is uh, uh, at Hans Rapids here. This is a picture of a diabase dulk, <laughs> a, a dike. Diabase is the material there, the molten material that you see squeezed up between these different layers. Uh, a dike uh, penetrates through different layers. A sill uh, it goes goes parallel along the layers. On the ledge. Further downstream, where this picture was taken, there was a similar material, diabase. Diabase cell. They took that and sent it to radiometric dating labs. Right. Kind of what we did, just did in the last last session here, and they came up with different dates. Here's the data that came back from the labs, uh, dating the same rock. Right. Look, look at the range there. Everything from 841 million years up to uh, uh, 1,379 million years. So what you're saying is you've got one sample, but different methods, and they all come up with different dates. Different dates. So it's not a different sample. different rock. It's the same rock. It's the same rock. That's like saying if I wanted to measure, for example, the height of this book, and if I had a uh, a metal ruler, a wooden ruler, and a plastic ruler, I'd get the same. I'd get a different measurement for the height of this book using different rulers. Right, but that hasn't so, changed. But the book hasn't changed, so that's not the problem. So what's the problem? The, the rulers must be inaccurate. Right. And so the conclusion from this particular rate study was that the dating methods don't even agree amongst themselves. There's discordant isotope dates there. Right. So this group is suggesting then that the different radioisotope dates have been caused by different amounts of accelerated nuclear decay. That's right. And this is the direction we're heading. We'll talk more about this in a few moments. But right. that the decay rates, remember those assumptions we talked about there, decay rates the, in the hourglass, the sand dropping. You know, right. what, what if the narrow part in the jar was opened up a lot? And with radiometric dating, what happens if the nuclear decay rates were accelerated in the past? That's going to make all of the rocks that are dated with this method seem artificially older. Right. And the difference between those two, you, you, again, you see the data there, 841 million years up to 1,379 million years. Why such a large difference? If there's been accelerated nuclear decay, shouldn't they still be kind of the same? Right. They give kind of the same value? So the idea is that now radioisotopes decay, uh, some with uh, alpha decay, some with beta decay. Different uh, types of, of, of decay, decay methods. Yes. So if they were accelerated in the past, but, but each one accelerated to a different level, you'd get these discordant dates that we seem to be coming up and with. And that's what the rate group is suggesting, that right. yes, there has been accelerated nuclear decay, and again, there's more evidence coming up shortly for that, but the different types of decay have been accelerated to different amounts. Right. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. In Genesis chapter 2, the order of creation seems to be different to that in chapter 1, with the plants being created after Adam. Does the Bible contradict itself here? A close look at the original language reveals that the plants mentioned in chapter 2 verse 5 refers to cultivated plants only, not all plants. The point being made is that in the world before the curse, before the appearance of thorns and thistles, no one was needed to cultivate plants. Another thing to keep in mind is that Genesis 2 is not a chronological account like chapter 1. It focuses mostly on the details of day 6. When the Bible appears to contradict itself, careful study always reveals that the Bible is free of contradiction. It really is the Word of God. Now the rate group has done a, a lot of research in different areas. Uh, we've already hinted just in the last uh, segment here that they've, they're suggesting accelerated nuclear decay as a uh, reason as a reason for these very very old dates using this particular dating method. Now they've published some very very technical material in in these books here, uh, the rate volume one and two. The the non technical version, which is still fairly technical, <laughs> is in this book thousands not billions, and it's just just groundbreaking research creationist research in this particular area. One of the things that they uh, spent some time researching was helium in zircons. 
Uh, this is the thing scientists do. They, they yes, investigate this. Is, this, this stuff. is what they do, I suppose. <laughs> it was a surprising discovery, actually, in these zircon crystals. And they, they, you find these in, in the basement rocks that make up the continents, pre Cambrian rocks, uh, about four kilometers down. It's about 300 degrees Celsius down there. And when that material cools and forms the, the granite and so on, um, it, 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 some of this forms these zircon crystals, zirconium silicate. Right. And within these zircon crystals, when the material cools, it incorporates some of the radioactive material. It'll incorporate some radioactive material. Right. Helium is produced as a byproduct of nuclear decay. Right. So when like uranium or something decays into something else, helium is produced as a byproduct. Right. They were surprised to learn that a lot of the helium is still there. It shouldn't be there. Now, why shouldn't it be there? Because helium's a very, uh, very, uh, very small, mo a very small atom, very slippery kind of. It, it's an inert, uh, inert gas when it's in right. the atmosphere. It doesn't react with with other elements, and so the helium should, once it's produced, uh, you know, slide its way out through the through the crystal into the surrounding rock and eventually into the atmosphere, and uh, some of it actually floats off into space. Okay, so you've got helium in these rocks. And, but these are like the Precambrian rocks. These these rocks are the, right. the basement rocks, right? Th these are supposed to be 1.5 billion years old, according to the evolutionary. That's the age that has paradigm. been assigned to them. 1.5 billion years, which is a lot different than 6,000 years old. <laughs> which is what it creationists is, right? Say. That's what right. we'd suggest. It's they were creation weak rocks. Those were on day three. Right. God called those up or created those at that particular point. So they're right. about 6,000. Well, that's a huge difference. Okay. One and a half billion or 6,000. So. This can be used as a type of dating method. Okay. So if you do radioisotope dating on these rocks, you get one and a half billion years. Right. But if one and a half billion years have really elapsed, and there's been all this helium produced during that time, not much helium should be there. Right. It should have dissipated. Dissipated. Right. And in, in one particular sample they got from about a kilometer deep, about a thousand meters deep, 58% of the helium that was generated by one and a half billion years of radioactive decay, that amount of helium, 58% of it was still in the zircon. The remaining 42% was just outside the zircon in the surrounding rock. Hmm. So where did the helium go? It didn't go anywhere. Right. It's but they still is, there. But evolutionists would agree that helium should be able to escape this, this That's rock. That's right. That would be the equivalent of, um, uh, if we're driving toward Toronto. We're here in a, we're, we're pretty close to Toronto here in right. Orangeville. If you're driving toward Toronto and, and you, as you get closer, you see a massive mushroom cloud over Toronto. <laughs> like a nuke. <laughs> and you pull your car over on the side, but people are still whizzing by, and you see so you flag one of them down and pull them over and say, well, look, you, wh what are you doing going to Toronto? Right. And they say, no, 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 don't, don't worry about it. That happened 60 years ago, the <laughs> nuclear blast. It's 60 years old. Well, you the cloud is not going to last that long. Right. It's still there. So it's your still there. common sense would tell you that 60 years has not elapsed. It's been very recent. <laughs> that, 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 that Toronto's been blown up. But uh, <laughs> uh, that's the same thing with the, with the helium and the zircons. The helium is still there. Okay. So in order for this radioactive uh, decay to have taken place, it produces helium. Right. If 1.5 billion years has elapsed, there should be no helium. Right. That's how much helium is there, though. There's, a, there's about that much there. But pretty well 100% of the helium is either in the rock or in very close proximity. Right. So that's... That it hasn't dissipated. So what's the answer from the rate group? That's evidence, powerful scientific evidence for accelerated nuclear decay. There right. have been one and a half billion years, there has been one and a half billion years of nuclear decay happen very recently. Right. So the assumption that nuclear decay rates have been constant over the supposed one and a half billion, that's been disproved by science. There's powerful science now disproving that particular assumption that we talked about earlier to make radiometric dating accurate. It's no longer accurate, and we have science now to back that up. Many people think the Earth is billions of years old, but have you ever wondered exactly how scientists date rocks? In his video, Rocks and Ages, Do They Hide Millions of Years?, Dr. Emil Silvestru explains the assumptions that govern what geologists pretend to see in the rock record. A biblical model based on the cataclysmic flood makes much more sense of the rocks we find today. Emil Silvestru investigates geological anomalies that secular scientists avoid because they conflict with the idea of evolution. 
Imagine a tree fossilized in layers of rock that should have been separated by millions of years, yet the tree stayed intact. And what about fossilized pollen found in rocks that, according to evolutionary timelines, predate this type of complex life form? Dr. Sylvester explains evidences and shows how they support the Bible's teaching of a young Earth. So it's the In the News section, and I, I really enjoy this section actually because I'm always uh, searching websites and news sites and stuff like that, just you know, so we can do this segment actually. What's happening in the news? What's well, actually, well, uh, as a ministry, we have, we have folks, we subscribe to the evolutionary literature, yes. we're up on what's going on in the evolutionary community. So and as I've said many times, you can always find creation evolution related articles, it seems, uh, it seems it's a hot topic. So yes. this one here. Um, well, people m must have heard about this. It's the LHC, right? It's this uh, this science experiment that they're they're doing over in Europe, and many people are worried about it. Is it, it going to cause a black hole, or is it, you know, what exactly is it going to do? They're, they're searching for antimatter. Yeah. Anyway, it's this yeah. big science experiment, and, and it's in the news, and people are concerned about it. People are interested in it, and. And, so, and so this is an article that was on our website shortly after the first test firing on September 10th, 2008. Right. And there was uh, some interesting comments. Anyway. Yeah, this is from uh, Dr. Russell Humphreys, and uh, he's one of the scientists on staff with Creation Ministries in the United States. And uh, he just brought gl great clarity, I found, to, to the... Yes, to the thing. yeah. So it's the Large Hadron Collider, Will, it, will a Black Hole Swallow Us? And... Um, uh, he starts the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, in Switzerland, fired its first shot last Wednesday, September 10, 2008. Contrary to some people's worries, it doesn't uh, appear to have made a black hole that is swallowing up the Earth. <laughs> the needless worries were generated by uh, science publicity that A, it would produce, uh, reproduce a small-scale piece of the alleged Big Bang, of course that's the, the tie into our ministry, the Big Bang, and that the Big Bang piece might make a tiny but hungry black hole. That might gobble up the earth. Right. That was the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the concern. So, number one, they believe in the Big Bang, and, and they are concerned it might recreate it. Um, the truth is not as cataclysmic as that, but still interesting to us science groupies. The LHC, operated by the European Center for Nuclear Research, is designed to fling small bunches of protons, a type of hadron or heavier elementary particle, at each other at speeds close to that of light. When the accelerator gets up to full capacity in about a year, each proton will have a record-breaking 7 trillion electric, uh, electron volts of energy. For comparison, if the atoms in your body bounce around uh, each uh, with 1 40th of an electron volt. So this is, <laughs> this is pretty high intensity stuff. <laughs> Trillions of electron volts is needed is indeed a lot of energy for a man to pack into a tiny particle, but God does it all the time in cosmic rays that strike the Earth continually. My doctoral dissertation studied cosmic ray protons with 10 TeV energies striking a blo block of granite consisting of carbon atoms atop a mountain in Colorado. Another fun thing that scientists do, apparently. So that was, that was the, 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 the LHC was, um, was seven TeV, and, and uh, Dr. Humphreys was doing things at 10, 10. TeV. Okay. That's right. Yeah. When the LHC eventually begins clashing two proton beams in opposite directions, the collisions will produce the same results as a 100,000 um, TeV cosmic ray proton slamming into, stationary, into a stationary nucleus. To date, nobody has noticed any little black hole stemming from those not infrequent, very high energy cosmic rays, certainly not earth gobbling black holes. Such collisions are fascinating to the physicists because they probe the nature of matter at very small scales. The LHC will explore particles forces at distances about one thousandth the diameter of a proton. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is where the article gets kind of interesting for the ordinary person, right? Because right. You, what is an accelerator? What is the LHC? <laughs> Why do I care about it? What, it has, right. what does it have to do with my life? This gets a little bit, you know, what are they trying to do? And Dr. Humphreys, it just, I found, explains it so well in this article. Right. When the two protons collide, they will produce a tiny ball of extremely hot, dense plasma made up of constituents of protons, quarks, and gluons. The great temperature of the ball of plasma over a billion degrees Celsius should rip, as happens at lower energies, many tiny but massive particles out of the fabric of space itself. Not to worry, God has made the fabric able to repair itself when things cool down, he puts in. The distribution of these secondary particles tells physicists how the forces between particles work. Experimenters may even find the elusive particle known as the Higgs boson, which I and few other, a few other physicists could interpret as the main constituent of the fabric of space itself. So though the Big Bang is science fiction, the tiny bang the LHC will make should tell us lots of fascinating new things about the basic stuff of the cosmos God 
has created. In the long run, it can't help but glorify him. Yeah, I just thought that was a great article about something that's happening in the news that people were very concerned about, and we'll, we'll say more about that. Right. Uh, but, but, but there it's just explained. Oh, what they're trying to do is try to figure out what the stuff of space is made out of. They smash these things together and then different pieces break off and then they discover, oh, it's a, you know, that's what they're trying to do. So even right. as a layman, you, can, you get an idea of what, <laughs> what all of this is about. Well, to be honest, I mean, I heard of this uh, experiment, but it only really started getting out in the media a lot as soon as it was, well, maybe they're going to create a rip in the fabric of space. Well, it's going to be a big was, that so was it's the concern. Over dramatization yeah. and, and, and many people talking about it over the water cooler at work and stuff like that. But that's the thing, right? Yeah, and, and most people know what black holes are, right? Right. Uh, a black hole, well, that's, that's something that's incredibly dense and it, and it gobbles up matter. Right. You know, so it, are, are they going to make a black hole or something like Well, as a matter of fact, MSN News had a, um, and, and we, at the bottom of Dr. Humphrey's article, he comments on, on what was reported in MSN News. Um, it says the, the media hype in the West was bad enough, but in India, the media publicity caused an unprecedented reaction among some sections of the public. It was reported that one teenager, one teenager girl, was so traumatized by doomsday warnings about the European Big Bang experiment that she killed herself. I mean, now maybe this was a disturbed individual or an unbalanced individual, but, you know, I, I guess when some people say, well, why do you guys talk about science? Shouldn't we just get on about the Bible? People's worldviews are interconnected. There isn't science over here and the Bible over here and your world. It, it, right. It's all together. As, as much as Stephen Jay Gould would like us to believe when he would have liked us to believe. Overlapping magisteria. Exactly. But. So here are people learning, about, oh, well, maybe the world's going to end and I'm going to kill myself. I mean, folks, you know, but like you said, th there's clarity. Maybe if she just read an article and gone, oh, okay, we're not going to all die in a big yeah. black, black hole. And, and there's cosmic rays that, that come in from space and, and, uh, and theoretically could do the same thing as this, uh, as this reactor and so right. on. But it's just a, a, a kind, of, it's kind of a sad comment on what is otherwise a, a pretty cool experiment over there in England <laughs> about this, you know, the largest uh, accelerator um, right. that's ever been built. The thing that's, that no one questions, of course, that are, I mean, some of us do, but the whole concept that we're recreating the Big Bang, that the Big Bang is actually just a fact, that we all just know it, that there's proof right, for it and all that, that kind of well. stuff. And, yeah. and it's just, people just accept it as, as fact, but anyway, it's not a fact. <laughs> that's right. So there's another article that, uh, that appeared in um, uh, Creation Magazine, and uh, there, there's that in the news section in Creation Magazine, mm. and here's one. Is TB very good? Tuberculos tuberculosis, is it very good? Researchers from the United States, Turkey, and Germany found evidence of tuberculosis in a human skull from western Turkey. Tiny one to two millimeter lesions aligned along the bone just behind the right eye socket indicate a type of tuberculosis. And this, this indicates, you know, the, 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 the article is just a very short news clip here. It's actually in the focus section right. in Creation Magazine. You get all these very, very short news clips here. Could tuberculosis be that old? It was dated at 500,000 years. Well, no, it couldn't. And the, and the article goes on to show that uh, it actually is more consistent with understanding the biblical timeline in a short time frame. Right. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Most evolutionists believe that two non-chickens mated and the DNA in their new zygote contained the mutations that produced the first true chicken. Unfortunately for evolutionists, the science of genetics does not support their claim. Geneticist Dr. Lee Spetner wrote, not even one mutation has been observed that adds even a little information to the genome. According to the Bible, chickens came first. God created a functionally complete universe. Adam and Eve were created as mature humans, complete with the ability to communicate with God and each other. Thousands, not billions. Radioisotope dating is one of the linchpins of evolutionary education today. This dating method is used by evolutionists to cast doubt on the reliability of the Bible and its chronology of Earth history. In the book, Thousands Not Billions, Dr. Don DeYoung summarizes the results of an eight-year creationist research initiative devoted specifically to investigate radioisotope dating. 
groundbreaking original research results are explained at a layman's level. Evolutionists seek to undermine faith in Genesis as the true record of history of the universe. When people are told that a dinosaur bone has been determined to be tens of millions of years old by radioisotope dating, that obviously doesn't fit with the biblical record of the land animals and man being created on day six of creation. This book demonstrates that Christians no longer have to puzzle over this glaring contradiction and is highly recommended for anyone trying to harmonize modern science with the biblical record. So just before we continue with the radio isotope, and that's the, the purpose of this, uh, this show, of course, I thought it would be good because we kind of ran out of time in the, uh, in the news section. Um, you were talking about this article in Creation Magazine, is TV very good? And the point being that they found evidence of tuberculosis in a skull that they, uh, by evolutionary standards, was dated at 500,000 years ago. Right. Right. So that would put it already in place, wherever it was at the point in history that God called his creation very good. So could tuberculosis have been there at that time? No. Right, exactly. So we, again, we're just pointing these things out to show people because these are the things that slip out in the news all the time and many Christians don't, right. either they don't they realize just, oh, that it's... Oh, it's no big deal, but, uh, it's, but it is. It's contradicting their worldview all the time. Yeah. So back to radioisotopes. So that one of the things <laughs> the rate team uh, uh, looked at in addition to these, these radioisotope methods that give the billions of years, they looked at carbon dating. Now, carbon dating has nothing to do with millions of years. It's a common misconception. Right. Carbon-14 decays much too quickly. The way the, way the, the, the method works is it, it's sort of similar to what we described before. Something radioactive, carbon-14 in this case, decaying into something else. In this case, nitrogen-14. Mm -hmm. How do you get carbon-14? Well, that's created in the upper atmosphere when a, a, an atom of nitrogen-14 is struck by a cosmic ray. And it's changed into carbon-14, which is the radioactive uh, version of carbon-12, the normal carbon. Right. And that carbon-14 acts much the same way that carbon-12 does. It's absorbed into plants through photosynthesis, carbon dioxide, and so on. And then animals get it, and we get it, and, yeah, and yeah. everything's radioactive to about the same level. We have this carbon-14. Now, when a living thing dies, right. it stops taking in, obviously, carbon, carbon-14. And so the carbon-14 that the living thing had or has begins to decay and, and then leave, uh, begins to turn back into Because it's no longer 14. taking any carbon-14 right. in. So the way the dating method works is you look at the, um, the regular amount of carbon, carbon-12, and relate that to the amount of carbon-14. Right. And, and you were mentioning that it doesn't give a date of billions of years. Because this is, this is the dating method I get, you know, people will ask questions, what about carbon it's, dating? Yes, yes. And they think millions of years. But with our measuring devices, um, basically, uh, carbon should not exist in any sample more than 250,000 years. Because right. the decay rate would be such that after that period of time, th there just should be basically... Even 100,000 years. And there's an excerpt that we'll read out of, um, out of thousands, not billions, mm -hmm. that explains this in more detail. Right. Yes, because many people don't really understand how this works, right? So uh, here's the section in here, the pervasiveness of carbon-14. Rocks and fossils containing carbon occur in abundance through the Earth's strata. Once living organisms now buried in the strata incorporated some carbon-14 within themselves while they were alive. For, each, uh, for Earth materials classified as ancient, all of this original C14 content should be completely decayed away. For example, after 10 half-lives of decay, any radioactive material has only 0.1% remaining of its original content. So it's decaying away over time. This small percentage results from multiplying the fraction one-half by itself 10 times over. Hence, right. half-lives. Okay. For carbon-14, this length of time, 10 half-lives, is 57,300 years. If the elapsed time is extended still longer to 17 or 18 half-lives, corresponding to about 100,000 years, carbon-14 decays to an entirely negligible level that is undetectable by current measurement techniques. So here they're capping at around 100,000. 100,000 years, there's nothing left. Right. Yeah. To express this in another way, any carbon-containing materials that are truly older than 100,000 years should be carbon-14 dead. Okay. It, it, just, it should have gone, it decayed to a point where there's nothing left. And we can't measure it anymore, as they say, with using the, the apparatuses that we have. Right. With C14 levels below detection limits. This fact gives rise to a major challenge to the long-age assumption for rocks and fossils. In recent years, readily detectable amounts of carbon-14 have been the rule rather than the ex exception. Right. This is true for samples throughout the fossil-bearing parts of the geological record with presumed ages extending to hundreds of millions of years. The unexpected carbon-14 was 
initially assumed to be a result of contamination, most likely from the experimental counting procedures, but as this problem was aggressively explored, it was realized that most of the carbon-14 was inherent to the samples being measured. So what, the, what they're discovering is that just about everything has carbon-14. What the rate group did is they took samples of coal, Right. Carbon. Yeah. <laughs> they took coal samples that have been in storage, uh, the samples from different areas, both young and old. Right. The evolutionary dating for these coal samples ranged from a, as little as 34 million years up to 312 million years. Right. And there, million years, there should be no carbon left. All of the samples of coal still had carbon-14 in them. What does that mean? They're not millions of years old. Have you ever heard a biblical conversation like this? I just can't accept that Jonah was in the great fish for three literal days. The days could be referring to some undefined time period millions of years long. We can't know for sure what the word days means in Jonah. Would that sound reasonable to you? Of course not. From the context and grammar used, anyone that reads about Jonah in the Bible would easily come to the conclusion that Jonah was inside the great fish for three literal days. Do Christians argue that the days in Genesis are something other than literal days because the text is unclear? Not at all. The meaning of the word day in Genesis is as clear as day. There's one thing that should be pointed out here because I, I find a lot of times many, many Christians, many creationists, you know, when we're talking about carbon dating and things like that, they're, they're almost put on the defensive, you right. know, versus the evolution yes. position. But look what we just talked about. We've got rock layers that evolutionists are dating to be millions of years old. We find samples of once living things inside of them and they always contain carbon. Right. So what is this showing? That this is actually positive proof for the creationists. C carbon dating, far from being a, 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 a a, a good proof for evolution is actually a friend of young earth creationism yes. because if yes. you're always finding carbon in these things that are supposedly millions of years old like coal and again you you're, you're you're disproving the other side it's actually evidence for our side right carbon right. dating is a, is a friend for young earth creationists that's right mm -hmm. and it, it gets even better than that when we, we just finished talking about coal the rate group also tested diamonds right. for C14. Now, no evolutionist would ever think of doing this because diamonds, everybody knows that diamond is millions of years old, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> diamond's supposed to be millions of years old. A diamond is the, the, the hardest natural substance on earth. Right. And so the, the thing with testing diamonds that's so much better than just testing coal is maybe the coal can be contaminated with, with modern carbon-14 and right. so on. Maybe it was somehow contaminated. A diamond is virtually impossible to contaminate because its matrix of carbon is, 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 is so accurate. So, you know, th there's not room there to contaminate it. Right. So these diamonds were tested, and guess what they found? <laughs> C14 in diamonds. Right. Uh, it, all the coal and diamond samples tested gave ages ranging from about 44,000 to 57,000 years old. Uh, Four factors, these are this carbon dating, this right. a, find, the, find the, the, the carbon-14 and so on. There's four factors that make these dates unrealistically old. Number one, the pre-flood biosphere, this is the, 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 uh, the conditions before the flood, right. had about 100 times more carbon than in the world today. The flood buried huge amounts of carbon. Right. So there would have been more carbon-14 before the flood anyway. Right. I've actually said that to people who have questioned me when, when they say, I say, well, I know you don't believe the flood happened, but if it did occur, what would that do to your C14 cycle? Wow, it would mess it up, but that never happened. Well, that's an assumption. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what if it did happen? And th there's all these possibilities. Another one is that the magnetic field was stronger in the past, meaning slower production of C14. Right. That's another possibility leading to uh, um, advanced age in some of these things. Uh, number three, some of the C14 might be from when the Earth was created. How much C14 was there uh, when the Earth was created? The rate group has suggested things right. like this. Accelerated nuclear decay, which we've talked about as being a reality, a scientifically uh, demonstrated reality, right. accelerated nuclear decay may have produced substantial C14 in the material themselves as they were sitting in the Earth. Right. So they didn't even get it from the atmosphere. It may have produced it right there. So. The real question is, and why is the C14 still there? 
because it hasn't had time to decay. Right. That, that, that seems to be a pretty logical conclusion, right? Now, if there has been greatly increased radioactive decay in the past, uh, there's some questions we could ask too. Yes, yes, it's right? not without its problems. When we propose that uh, you know the, ex the the decay rates were accelerated many times, what we observe today. Right, because if you had rapid accelerated decay, you'd have heat. It's going to generate a lot. It's going to generate a lot of heat. So, how would uh, how would a creationist explain that? Like, what did you do with all the heat? Or <laughs> yes, that's one of the problems. And you can look at the, uh, for example, the rate materials and so on. And uh, they explain some some possibilities there. Right. One of the possibilities for getting rid of the heat is the expansion of space. Right. The Bible says in, uh, in more than ten times that God stretched out the heavens like a tent or like a curtain. Right. God stretches the heavens, that, that type of terminology. Right. If you have a container and you stretch the container out without letting any air into the inside, right. you're, you're, you're essentially dissipating the heat. The heat just disappears. The, the, the atoms are moved further away from one another and they right. don't react. And so so the, the heat the, the heat doesn't have to radiate away or, or, or through convection right. get out of the container somehow. It just goes away. So by stretching space and you're stretching matter with that, relativity right. and so on, that's a possibility for getting rid of the heat. The Bible tells right. us that this happened in the past. If those two events happened at the same time, the stretching of space plus accelerated nuclear decay, right. that could account for uh, where did the heat go? Right. So. There are answers to these questions. I mean, you know, there's two different models, but it seems to me that when you actually take a look at hard science, what the rate group has shown is sure consistent with the Bible. Finding answers to questions about the origins debate, creation or evolution? When the results are in, which one is supported by scientific observations? Find out at creationontheweb.org. Creation scientists and researchers from around the world have contributed more than 5,000 articles, many of which appeared in leading creation's publications like Creation Magazine and the Journal of Creation over more than 30 years. A new daily front page article keeps web visitors informed about the latest breaking news in the creation evolution debate. When news breaks about the latest evolutionary ape man, or some major supposed evidence for evolution, check out creationontheweb.org for a Christian creationist response. Each weekend, the website features a feedback article, a response to web visitors' email feedback. Often, the anti-creationist arguments in skeptics' emails are refuted in a detailed response by a CMI staff member. So in a very practical way, believers can see that the Bible, and particularly Genesis, can be defended against skeptics' arguments. The website includes an online store where you can browse through hundreds of the world's leading creationist books, DVDs, and related materials, all available to build up the faith of the believer. Got questions? Get answers at creationontheweb.org. Okay, so we're in the feedback section here. I really enjoy the feedback section when yes. uh, people can uh, email into the, the ministry and ask questions and make comments, and it's, it's a lot of fun. This is a particular feedback that we got relating to an evidence that I present when I'm speaking, when I get asked about carbon-14 or radiometric dating, that type of stuff, radioisotope right. dating. And let me just read the, read the comment here. It says, I checked out the Department of Earth Sciences at Brock University and noticed that they offer a radiocarbon dating service. One of their samples, BGS-43, was dated 3,000 years in the future more than once. I found this very curious and thought you might as well. Well, we do find it yeah, quite curious. Very curious. <laughs> and this is actually, I have a slide made up, so when I'm asked in a Q&A time about these, these types of things, I'll, I'll put this slide up. And it's a piece of coalified wood uh, from, um, uh, from uh, Brock University. So they've, they've checked out this sample and they keep measuring it and it keeps coming out to plus 3,000 years into the future. So you put this slide up in the Q&A time and people are looking at it and they, how can that be? Because they're so trained to think, well, you're measuring time, but you're not measuring time, as we've just mentioned many times. Right. You're measuring the amount of some kind of substance in the sample. In this sample, there is so much C14, it shouldn't come into existence for another 3,000 years. 
Right, and and the and carbon dating measures the death of a living thing, the point of when it dies. So right. this thing died three thousand years from now. It, it doesn't make sense. So it, it no. really makes the point, and it kind of shocks people out of their complacency into just thinking, oh, well, you're just measuring time, and it's for sure we right. know. And, and then you can go on and talk about the assumptions that we've talked about on the on the program. Exactly. Already. And uh, as our um, person responds to them, um, he's talking about this, uh, this piece of qualified wood. It was found in Oak Island in, in Canada. And the person responding mentions the fact that, well, in the 50s and 60s, there was a, a, a dramatic increase in the levels of radiocarbon because of testing of atmospheric uh, nuclear bombs. Right. So, you know, he's admitting, well, there's ways you could explain that anomaly, but it's still no benefit to the evolutionists because really what you're showing is that there's all these different factors that could really change the outcomes. Yeah, quite dramatically. Quite dramatically. <laughs> in this case. Including, as he, he goes down later on, the fact that there was a huge event in Earth's history. Now, most secular uh, scientists deny it, but it was the Great Flood. What would have that produced? You know, you're burying all this biomass and, and all this kind of stuff. You've got massive volcanism throughout the world. What would that have done to your carbon-14 cycle? It's, it's going to upset it, certainly. It's going to upset it a lot. And uh, towards the end of the, the article, uh, Andrew Lamb, who was responding, uh, gives some interesting information about the whole concept of carbon-14 dating. There's the comment. And how it was calibrated, right? Right. Carbon date, uh, dating began in the late 40s, and some of the first things to be carbon dated were Egyptian artifacts including the coffin of the pharaoh Djoser. The date of this pharaoh's death was already considered to be accurately established at 2750 BC. So here they're saying, okay, we need a set point. We need a, a zero point. We need someone to calibrate the, 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 the measurements that we're getting from right. C14. So data. they take this artifact, they have assigned a date to it, but now listen to what's happened to the date. We know this date is incorrect because Egypt is a post-flood civilization and this date precedes the flood by uh, several hundred years, so we're, that's what we're saying that from a creationist point of view. We know this date's wrong. However, right. tests like these on ancient Egyptian artifacts form the basis for the calibration of the carbon dating method, but scholars are now coming to the realization that the traditionally accepted Egyptian chronology was greatly in error and needs shortening by hundreds of years. A revolution in ancient chronology has been steadily building over the last decade with a number of scholars publishing hard to refute evidence that traditional Egyptian chronologies are overextended by many hundreds of years. More and more archaeologists are beginning to accept that revision is inevitable. So right at the beginning when C14 dating was invented and, and attempted to be calibrated, it, was, it may have been calibrated, what we're suggesting here, right. may have been calibrated incorrectly. Right. So your, your starting assumption is wrong. And then you've got another starting assumption that's wrong, that these dates are correct. And you could have wildly discordant right. dates, yeah. which is what we've found. Got another feedback here called, what about the Stone Age? It's a popular idea that ev evolutionists talk about the Stone Age. Right. Uh, part of the letter that was written in says, thanks for all your articles. I really enjoyed them. I am an anthropology student. May I ask how a creationist prehistoric archaeologist would date their findings within the Stone Ages, for example? And the, the letter goes on a little bit, and, and I'll read part of the response that, uh, that came from one of our guys. The terms creationist and prehistoric do not go well together. In some ways, there is no such thing as prehistory because the Bible is a historical record that goes right back to creation. That's part of the answer. It goes on in more detail. Right. The idea of a Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, etc., is an attempt to describe the archaeological data within an evolutionary framework. It's just an evolutionary story about what they call prehistory, but it really doesn't work because it's not true. If you read Genesis, you'll see that right from the beginning, people were familiar with hunting, agriculture, nomadic life, cities, music, bronze, and ironwork. And that's in Genesis 4. You can, you can look that up. That was before the flood. And those who built the ark obviously survived the flood, uh, from whom we are all descended. So they were capable of a high standard of culture and development. And so the Stone Age, Stone Age tools, that kind of thing, uh, there may have been a Stone Age um, shortly af after the Tower of Babel. If people migrate away from there, you, you lose technology and so on. Right. We've been talking about radiometric dating. The bottom line with the rate group and all the research that they've done is there should be virtually no helium or C14 in rocks, diamonds, or coal if they're millions of years old. But there, is, there are those materials there. They're not millions of years old. <laughs>